Hello and welcome to the ISTQB Foundation Agile Level Training and Certification Program. Single solution for your preparation. This accredited course is going to teach you each and everything you need to know to become a successful ISTQB certified professional. While other courses only cover the theoretical concepts, our course not only covers these theoretical concepts, but also covers real-time examples. In addition, we make sure you remember the topics by providing revisions, quizzes, and different exercises. The highlight of this course is that it contains topic-wise explanation, topic-wise quizzes, chapter-wise quizzes, two sample question papers, two mock tests, which will give you real exam experience. In total, you will get more than 300 questions, which is enough to clear the real ISTQB exam. Our courses are not developed by just one person, but a special team of highly qualified professionals and experienced educators who are working in the leading industries. This includes subject matter experts to help you with technical topics, trained voiceover artists to make sure you get a great audio learning experience, and an experienced graphic designer to enhance the visualization. We have a wide experience in teaching online and we have more than 30 popular courses listed in online platform for different certifications. It is our genuine pleasure to use all our experience and expertise to train you and help you obtain an official ISTQB certification. As of now, we are teaching in 143 countries with more than 1 lakh students and still growing. Now it's your turn to join our growing family and become part of it. In return, you will get advice from industry experts who will help you throughout the course. Join ISTQB Foundation Agile Level Training by enrolling now and become part of us. There is no need to worry. This course is backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee. You got nothing to lose. Let's get you ISTQB certified. The first chapter is Agile Software Development. This is an introductory lecture where we will see what we are going to learn in this chapter. Let's first go through all the keywords which you should know at the end of this lecture. I am listing them here so that you pay more attention when they are covered in the lecture. The keywords are Agile Manifesto, Agile Software Development, Incremental Development Model, Iterative Development Model, Software Lifecycle, Test Automation, Test Basis, Test Driven Development, Test Oracle, and User Story. These are the 11 keywords which you should know. Along with the keywords, there are two learning objectives of this chapter. First, we will cover the fundamentals of Agile software development. And second, we will see the different aspects of Agile approaches. Let's start with Chapter 1, Agile software development. In this lecture, we will see the overview of the fundamentals of Agile software development. Now that you are a certified ISTQB tester, let's explore what is the difference between a traditional and an Agile project. First of all, a tester on an Agile project will work differently than one working on a traditional project. The main difference is in traditional development methodologies. The sequence of the phases in which the project is developed is linear, whereas, in Agile, it is iterative. To understand this point, I will explain a linear model and an iterative model. Let's first see the linear model, or sometime called as an incremental model. The V model is the example of the incremental model. In this model, first, we have a user requirement which is provided by the customer. Then, from the user requirement, we write the system requirement. Once the system requirement is in place, we will write the global design and the detailed design. And once the design is done, we will start implementing the software. These are the steps in this development activity. You get the user requirement, create the system requirement, then develop the global and detailed design. And finally, you implement the code. 
Now, once the implementation is over, the software is ready. Then we perform a component testing on it. Once that is done, we perform integration testing. After integration, we will do system testing. And finally, the acceptance testing. After the software passes through all of these tests, it will be ready for the operational system's use. As you can see, this development model looks exactly like a V, which is where its name came from. Now, how is this model more advantageous than the sequential model? The advantage is that all these testing activities are parallel to the development activities. Let's take a look. These are the development activities, and these are the testing activities. Once you have the user requirement, even if you have not done any of the below steps, you can start preparing test cases from the requirement for the acceptance testing. Similarly, when you're in the system requirement stage, you can start preparing for the system test. Since you have the requirements, you can start writing the test cases. Once the software comes, you can execute them. The process is happening parallelly. When the development activity starts, the testing activities can also start at the same time. Now, let's move on to the design phase. Once you have the design, you know how the components are going to interact. What are the interfaces between them? So, once you know all of that, you can start to prepare test cases for the integration testing. And finally, when you have the implemented code, you can start component testing. This is how the development models function. All the development activities on the left correspond with the testing activities on the right. Here, you will start getting feedback as early as possible. Once you have the user requirement, the testing will begin. Let's see the iterative development model. An example is an agile model. This is the most popular model in the industry right now. Suppose you have a software that you need to implement in three weeks, and it has 15 requirements. If you use the Agile model, then this is how it will work. The Agile model will have three different phases. Each phase will be for one week. Phase one is for the first week. Phase two is for the second week. And phase three will show the third week. Since we have to complete the project in three weeks, the time has been divided in this way. Now, we have 15 requirements, so we decide to develop five requirements in phase one, five in phase two, and five in phase three. At the end of three weeks, we will have 15 implemented requirements. Why are we doing this in phases? Because we analyze and test and develop the first five requirements, then send it to the customer for feedback. If there are any changes to be made in the process, we find out about it in the first phase. Then, as per the feedback, we can implement that in phase two. This is the biggest advantage of the Agile method. You get the customer's feedback from the earliest stage. And in every stage, when you release the software to the customer, it will be fully working. At the end of phase one, you have five requirements in the working stage, but at the end of phase two, you won't be releasing just five requirements to the customer for feedback. You will be releasing 10 requirements in the working stage. From phase one and two, and at the end of phase three, of course, you should have a complete working software that will fulfill all 15 requirements fulfilled. This is how the Agile method works. Each phase has define, develop, build, test, and implementation stage. So we can see that live implementation of the software will happen in all of the phases. We are repeating the steps in each one, and this is why it is called an iterative development model. Now we know how sequential and agile models work. Since the Agile model is highly iterative, testers must understand the value and principles that underpin Agile projects and how testers are an integral part of a whole team approach together 
with developers and business representatives. The members in an agile project communicate with each other early and frequently, which helps with removing defects early and developing a quality product. This is another picture which illustrates the iterative agile sequence. As you can see here, the analysis design code and test phases are repeated again and again. And with the picture, I end this lecture here. In this lecture, we will cover Agile Software Development and the Agile Manifesto. Here, the learning objective is to recall the basic concept of Agile Software Development based on the Agile Manifesto. This is marked as K1. So you will get a direct question from this topic, and you have to remember the points here. Agile Manifesto has two parts. In the first part, it contains four statement of values, and the second part, it contains 12 principles. In this lecture, we will cover the four statements, and in the next lecture, we will cover 12 principles. Let's first see the history of Agile Manifesto. In 2001, a group of individuals representing the most widely used lightweight software development methodologies agreed on a common set of values and principles which became Manifesto for Agile Software Development, or the Agile Manifesto. In simple terms, Agile Manifesto contains a set of values and principles. Let's see the four sets of values. The first statement is, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Second statement is, working software over comprehensive documentation. The third statement is, customer collaboration over contract negotiation. The fourth statement of value is responding to change over following a plan. The Agile Manifesto argues that although the concepts on the right have value, those on the left have greater value. The Manifesto is not suggesting to replace the items in right with left, rather it stresses upon prioritizing left items over right. The Agile Manifesto was created as an alternative to document-driven heavyweight software development processes such as the waterfall approach. Now let's understand each of the four statements one by one. The first statement is individuals and interactions over processes and tools. To understand this point, let's consider two scenarios. In scenario one, to build software you are working as a team and the member of the team communicates and interacts with each other to get the best implementation idea. In the second scenario, you are working independently. You are dependent on the defined process and tool for the implementation. Since in this scenario we are not much interacting with the other team member, we don't know if we are implementing the best software. By comparing the two scenarios, we can say that easily say that scenario 1 is better. With this, we can say that teams of people build software and it is through continuous communication and interaction, rather than a reliance on tools or processes, that teams can work most effectively. That is the reason in Agile Manifesto we give more importance to individuals and their interactions over processes and tools. The second statement is working software over comprehensive documentation. To understand this, we will again consider two scenarios. In scenario one, suppose after iteration, one you implemented two features out of 15 features and they are working. Along with that, you have a few documents which you send to the customer. Similar way after the second iteration, you implemented four features. So in total, you implemented six features out of 15. Now all the six features are working and again you sent it to the customer for feedback with minimum required documents. This is how you are working in scenario one. Now let's move on to scenario two. 
Here you worked for a month and tried to implement all the features, but currently they are not working as implementation is not complete. Here after each stage you have created a lot of documentation to keep the track of your project. Now you can see which scenario is better. In scenario 1 you always have a working software with few documents. Whereas in the second scenario, you have lots of documents and still software is not working. Therefore, if you think from a customer perspective, working software is much more useful and valuable than overly detailed documentation because working software provides an opportunity to give the development team rapid feedback. In addition, because working software with reduced functionality is available much easier in the development lifecycle, agile development can confer a significant time to market advantage. Agile development is, therefore, especially useful in rapidly changing business environments where the problems and or solutions are unclear or where the business wishes to innovate in new problem domains. That is the reason in Agile Manifesto we give more importance to working software over comprehensive documentation. The third statement is customer collaboration over contract negotiation. We'll see two scenarios to understand this point. In scenario one, you see that the customer is not able to specify the system that they required. Since you are the expert in the field, you provide support to them to specify the system. By doing this, you are a collaboration with them and helping them to develop a better product. In scenario two, whenever a customer asks you for support, you show him the contract saying that it's not mentioned here, so you will not provide. Or every time they come to you, you try to negotiate the contract. By seeing both scenarios, we can say that scenario one is better because by collaborating with the customer, we understand their requirement better. With this explanation, we can say that customers often find great difficulty in specifying the system that they require. Collaborating directly with the customer improves the likelihood of understanding exactly what the customer requires. While having contracts with customers may be important, Working in regular and close collaboration with them is likely to bring more success to the project. That is the reason in Agile Manifesto, we give more importance to customer collaboration over contract negotiation. The fourth statement of value is responding to change over following a plan. Let's understand this with two scenarios. In the first scenario, we made an implementation plan. Based on the implementation planning, we started working. While working on the feature, we came to know that the customer has changed the feature. Then based on this input, we stopped working on the feature and made a new plan. Whereas in the second scenario, even after knowing that the feature was changed, we continued with the implementation as it was planned. In the next planning, we considered the new changes. Now if we compare both scenarios, we can easily say that in scenario 1, we saved lots of time because we responded to change quickly. With this explanation, we can state that change is inevitable in software projects. The environment in which the business operates, legislation, competitor activity, technology advances, and other factors can have a major influence on the project and its objectives. These factors must be accommodated by the development process. As such, having flexibility in work practices to embrace change is more important than simply adhering rigidly to a plan. That is the reason in Agile Manifesto we give more importance to responding to change over following a plan. So these are the four Agile Manifesto values we covered in this lecture. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan. Remember them as it is, as they are very important.
In this lecture, we will continue with Agile software development and the Agile Manifesto by covering 12 principles. These are the 12 Agile Manifesto principles which we are going to cover in this lecture. Let's understand each principle one by one. The first principle is, our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. Let's understand this point. In an Agile project, the iterations are of small duration, and it focuses on delivering working software to the customer after each iteration. This approach helps in satisfying the customer as they can see if the software is developed as per their expectation or not. That's why our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. The second principle is welcome changing requirements, even late in development. Agile processes harness change for the customer's competitive advantage. Let's understand this point. As we know, the market is quite competitive. For example, we take the mobile market. Every month we see an innovative product or feature. And to be in the market, we as a service provider should welcome changing requirements, even if it's late. That means, even if we are implementing as per the planned activity, but if we come to know that the feature is changed, we can be in a position to respond to this new change. This is the second principle. Welcome changing requirements. Even late in development, Agile processes harness change for the customer's competitive advantage. The third principle is deliver working software frequently at intervals of between a few weeks to a few months, with a preference to the shorter time scale. Let's understand this point. In Agile development, the software is released in iterations. As said previously, in each iteration, the focus is on providing the working software. This helps the development team to get continuous feedback on their developed product. And step by step, they build the complete software. And customers also know that the development of the product is correct. Therefore, the third principle is deliver working software frequently at intervals of between a few weeks to a few months with a preference to the shorter time scale. The fourth principle is business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. This point is very important. When we are working on a development project, we can succeed only if we work as a team. For example, suppose we want to implement an algorithm, and to implement this, if we conduct a brainstorming session, then we will get input from different people and decide which is the best approach. Therefore, in a team, business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. The fifth principle is build projects around motivated individuals. Give them the environment and support their needs, and trust them to get the job done. Let's understand this further. After the discussion is done and the implementation approach is finalized, it should be implemented by the motivation team. We should trust the people and their capabilities as we hired them for the project. We should provide the necessary environment and tools to get the job done. Therefore, in an agile project, we should build projects around motivated individuals, give them the environment and support they need, and trust them to get the job done. The sixth principle is the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. As per the Agile Manifesto, face-to-face -face conversion is more efficient compared to telephonic. Though in today's distributed environment, it's difficult to achieve every time. Whenever it's possible, we should conduct face-to-face -face meetings. The seventh principle is working software is the primary measure of progress. As we saw previously, the primary focus of iteration is to deliver working software. Because by seeing the working software, customer can provide the feedback not by seeing the progress report. Therefore. Working software is the primary measure of progress as per the seventh principle. 
The eighth principle is Agile processes promote sustainable development. The sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. Let's understand this point. Once we get the requirement, we make release planning. A single release can have multiple iterations of small duration, and in each iteration, few features will be developed. With this, we develop the software at a sustained pace. Now to support this development, each one in the team has to work at a constant pace. This is the eighth principle. Agile processes promote sustainable development. The sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. The ninth principle is continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. During the development, the team should continuously look for improvement in the process. They can enhance their skill by going through training or can learn a new skill. For example, they can learn a scripting language, which can help them to automate their day to day work. This is the ninth principle. Continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. The tenth principle is simplicity. The art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. This idea is central to eliminating waste. To make your progress more agile, do less. If you see that the search and process is no more required, then you can remove it. By doing this, next time you don't have to follow the process which doesn't help you in improving your product. And this is called the art of maximizing the amount of work not done. The eleventh principle is the best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. Since the team takes responsibility of the products and the management, trusts the team and provides the necessary support. People discuss among themselves to make the best product by providing the best architectures, requirements, and designs. The eleventh principle is the best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. The last principle is at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective, then tunes and adjusts its behavior accordingly. Let's understand this point. Since the same team has to work for the product in the future and they are responsible for developing it, they will try to reduce their effort but automating the day-to-day -day activities. So do this while working on the iteration, they will try to find out which all steps they can automate. After finding it, they will discuss it with the team to get the best way to automate the steps. By doing this, the team becomes more efficient for the next release. This is all about the last principle. At regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective then tunes and adjusts its behavior accordingly. Let's go through all the points once again to remember the points. The first principle is our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. The second principle is welcome changing requirements, even late in development. Agile processes harness change for the customer's competitive advantage. The third principle is deliver working software frequently at intervals of between a few weeks to a few months, with a preference to a shorter timescale. The fourth principle is business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. The fifth principle is build projects around motivated individuals. Give them the environment and support they need, and trust them to get the job done. The sixth principle is the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. The seventh principle is working software is the primary measure of progress. The eighth principle is agile processes promote sustainable development. The sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. The ninth principle is 
continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. The tenth principle is simplicity. The art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. The eleventh principle is the best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self organizing teams. And the final one, the twelfth principle, is at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective, then tunes and adjusts its behavior accordingly. There is no shortcut to remember these points. They are the Agile Manifesto principles, and you have to remember them for the exam and also for the interview. With this, the lecture ends, and exercise is provided in the next video. In this exercise, based on your understanding, match the core Agile Manifesto principles to the Agile Manifesto. Once done, you can match your answer with the solution provided by us, and it attaches as a resource with this lecture. Now you can pause the lecture and complete the exercise. In this lecture, we will cover whole team approach. Here, the learning objective is to understand the advantages of the whole team approach. This is marked as K2. Let's first see how an agile team is formed. In an agile team, we usually have three to nine people, which includes tester, developer, and customer representatives. Remember this point. In an Agile team, we consider the customer representative as part of the Agile team. Let's see some of the characteristics of the Agile team. The first characteristic is co-location. The team member shares the same workspace because co-location strongly facilitates communication and interaction, which is one of the principles of the Agile manifesto. The second characteristic is knowledge and skills. While forming the team, we should make sure that we involve everyone with the knowledge and skills necessary to ensure project success. That means here the main focus is to keep the team small and select team members with the necessary skills and knowledge. The third characteristic is daily stand-up meetings. The daily stand-up meeting takes place in the team to communicate the status. This meeting keeps the people in synchronization and promotes more effective and efficient team dynamics. This is done to achieve sustained development, which is one of the principles of the Agile Manifesto. So there were three characteristics of Agile team, co-location, knowledge and skills, and daily stand-up meetings. Now we will see the benefits of the whole team approach. The first benefit is enhancing communication and collaboration within the team. Since the team is small and co-located, communication is fast and efficient and encourages team collaboration. The second benefit is enabling the various skill sets within the team to be leveraged to the benefit of the project. While making an agile team, we select people with different skills and knowledge which helps the overall development of the project. Now let's see the most important benefit. Making quality everyone's responsibility. Since tester, developer, and customer representatives are part of the Agile team, they are all responsible to ensure the desired quality levels. Remember this point, ensuring quality is everyone's responsibility. These were the three benefits of an Agile team. Enhancing communication and collaboration within the team. Enabling the various skill sets within the team to be leveraged to the benefit of the project. Making quality everyone's responsibility. Now let's see an important concept. 
power of three. Power of three represents testers, developers, and business representatives. They work together in every step of the development process. Testers work with the business representative to help them to create an acceptance test, and tester work with the developer to agree on the testing strategy and to decide test automation approaches. This is how testers can transfer and extend testing knowledge to other team members and influence the development of the product. We saw how testers, developers, and business representatives work together. Now let's define the power of three. The concept of involving testers, developers, and business representatives in all feature discussions is known as the power of three. Summary An agile team is formed with three to nine people, which includes tester, developer, and customer representatives. Then we covered the three characteristics of an agile team co location, knowledge and skills, and daily stand up meetings. Next, we saw three benefits of the Agile team enhancing communication and collaboration within the team, enabling the various skill sets within the team to be leveraged to the benefit of the project, making quality everyone's responsibility, and in the end, we defined the power of three. The concept of involving testers, developers, and business representatives in all feature discussions is known as the power of three. And with this, the lecture ends. In this lecture, we will cover early and frequent feedback. The learning objective here is to understand the benefits of early and frequent feedback. This is marked as K2. In this lecture, we will cover how we get feedback from a customer in case of sequential development and in case of agile development. As we have seen previously in agile development, the iterations are short and are repeated frequently. This enables the project team to receive early and continuous feedback on product quality throughout the development lifecycle. Another way to provide rapid feedback is by continuous integration, which we will cover in the upcoming lecture. Now let's see how we get feedback in the sequential model. When sequential development approaches are used, the customer often does not see the product until the project is nearly completed. At that point, it is often too late for the development team to effectively address any issues the customer may have. That's why people had to look for another approach. Now let's see how we get feedback in an Agile model. When Agile development approaches are used, the customer sees the project after each iteration. And since the iterations are short, the feedback is frequent. Now let's see some important points. Early and frequent feedback helps the team focus on the features with the highest business value for associated risk, and these features are delivered to the customer first. It also helps manage the team better since the capability of the team is transparent to everyone. For example, everyone knows how much work can we do in a sprint or iteration? What could help us go faster? What is preventing us from doing so? Now let's see the benefits of early and frequent feedback. Avoiding requirements misunderstandings, which may not have been detected until later in the development cycle, when they are more expensive to fix. Clarifying customer feature requests. Making them available for customer use early. This way, the product better reflects what the customer wants. Discovering, via continuous integration, isolating and resolving quality problems early. Providing information to the Agile team regarding its productivity and ability to deliver. Promoting consistent project momentum. We will end this lecture with this picture, which clearly illustrates the risk of not having any early feedback mechanism.
In this lecture, we will see the overview of aspects of Agile approaches. There are several Agile approaches in use by organizations. Common practices across most Agile organizations include collaborative user story creation, retrospectives, continuous integration, planning for each iteration, planning for each overall release and a few of it we will cover in the upcoming lecture. These are the learning objectives which we are going to be covering. Recall Agile software development approaches. Write testable user stories in collaboration with developers and business representatives. Understand how retrospectives can be used as a mechanism for process improvement in Agile projects. Understand the use and purpose of continuous integration. Know the difference between iteration and release planning and how a tester adds value in each of these activities. Let's start with the topic, Aspects of Agile Approaches. In this lecture, we will cover extreme programming in detail. Here, the learning objective is to Recall Agile Software Development Approaches. This is marked as K1. So you have to remember the points. To make it easy for you, I will explain the points so that it will help you to remember them. There are several Agile approaches, each of which implements the values and principles of the Agile Manifesto in different ways. In this syllabus, three representatives of Agile approaches are considered Extreme Programming, Scrum, Kanban, and in this lecture, we will cover extreme programming in detail and in the upcoming lecture, we will cover Scrum and Kanban. Let's see what is extreme programming. Extreme programming, originally introduced by Kent Beck, is an agile approach to software development described by certain values, principles, and development practices. Many of the Agile software development approaches in use today are influenced by XP and its values and principles. In this lecture, we will cover 5 values of extreme programming and 14 principles as additional guidelines as well as 13 primary practice described by extreme programming. Let's see the 5 values. Extreme programming embraces these five values to guide development, communication, simplicity, feedback, courage, and respect, where communication means sharing and spreading knowledge across all team members. Most problems and mistakes are caused by a lack of communication. Smaller teams increase communication by reducing the number of communication lines. Simplicity means add new features when they are needed by creating the simplest pieces of code rather than planning for future use and generating large, complicated software that may never be used. Simplicity helps with communication, reduces the amount of code to write and improves the quality. Next is feedback. This is an important part of communication as it enables the team to gauge how far the system is from its needed features. It also helps with simplicity as the team can adopt a trial and failure approach. Courage. The team must be willing to make changes at any time when the design no longer fits and can be prepared to throw code away that doesn't work. Communication, simplicity, and feedback enables a team to have courage to handle big changes and major system refactoring. The last one is respect. Everyone gives and feels the same respect they deserve as a valued team member. Everyone contributes value even if it's simply enthusiasm. Developers respect the expertise of the customers and vice versa. Management respects our right to accept responsibility and receive authority over our own work. This is all about five values of extreme programming, which is used to guide development activity. Let's see the 13 principles of extreme programming, which provided additional guidelines, and they are humanity, economics, mutual benefit, self-similarity, 
improvement, diversity, reflection, flow, opportunity, redundancy, failure, quality, baby steps, and accepted responsibility. Now let's see what these words mean in an agile context. First is humanity, here. Human factors are key to delivering quality software as it needs to address the business goals and objectives for the users and organization. Second is economics. The software must produce business value. The third is mutual benefits. All activities should benefit all resources and organizations involved. Next is self-similarity. Here, we must be able to reuse similar previous solutions to issues they have encountered before, albeit with different contexts. The fifth is improvement. We should strive for continuous improvement. Sixth is diversity. That means we need to implement different skills, approaches within the team to find and resolve different issues and defects. The seventh principle is reflection. The team needs to regularly look at what is going well, what is going badly, and what can be done to improve upon this. The eighth is flow. Here, we need to maintain a continuous, steady flow of work rather than having to speed up near the end of an iteration. The ninth principle is opportunity. We need to see problems and issues as opportunities for improvement. The tenth is redundancy where we need to avoid adopting practices which will find the same defects in different ways. The eleventh principle is failure in a team one. Must not be afraid to fail as not only do people learn from their mistakes, but it also saves all the time in trying to find the perfect solution on the first attempt. The twelfth is quality. Everyone in the team must always strive to maintain quality at its highest level. The thirteenth principle is baby steps. It is much better to proceed towards a goal iteratively in a series of small steps as preparing a big change over a long period of time could be dangerous. The last principle is accepted responsibility. Responsibility needs to be accepted by looking at what can be achieved rather than what needs to be accomplished. The team members are more likely to accept responsibility for those tasks. With this, all the 14 principles are covered. You need to just remember the words. We provided explanation so that you understand the meaning is the words with respect to Agile project. Now let's see 13 primary practices described by extreme programming. I divided it into four groups so that you can easily remember them. First group is planning and analysis. Here, we four practices, stories, weekly cycle, quarterly cycle, and slack, where stories are nothing but the system functionality outlined in the form of a story. Weekly cycle means that the team estimates what stories will be delivered and implemented within that week. Similar to weekly cycle, we have quarterly quickly, where the team looks longer term at a higher level to estimate what be delivered and implemented within the next quarter. The last practice under planning and analysis is slack, which means adding a security margin by including some lower priority tasks on each iteration that can be dropped if the team gets behind. Second group is people factors, and here we have five practices. Sit together, whole team, informative workspace, energized work, and pair programming. Let's start with first practice, sit together. Working together in an open space helps maximize communication. Next is whole team practice. Team must be a cross-functional team with all the skills and perspectives to make the project a success. Third is informative workspace. Here, the workspace should be an informative area that enables the team to display the latest project status and other information visually. 
Next is energized work. So teams need to work at a constant pace to remain energized. Last one under people factor is pair programming. All code is written with two developers on the one machine. This promotes informal reviews, knowledge transfer, and produces better quality code. Next group is based on code design, where we have two practices, test-first programming and incremental design. In test-first programming, we write the test before the code so that the developer codes the minimal amount of code to pass the tests, avoids the developer adding all the extra bells and whistles. Next is incremental design. Designing when the team needs to rather than producing a big design up front. In most of the organization, people first write the code and then at the end make all the designs just to compel the process, which is not a correct practice. We should design in an incremental way. And the last group is related to coding practices, where we have 10 minute builds and continuous integration. 10 minute build is a popular concept where the system should be built and tested within 10 minutes so that it can be executed frequently and provides regular feedback. And second is continuous integration. Here, the developers need to regularly integrate any changes, ideally every two hours, to ease large integration headaches and enable code to be frequently integrated and tested. With this, all the practices of extreme programming are covered. Before we end this lecture, let's have a look into all the key points. In this lecture, we covered 5 values of extreme programming, 14 principles as additional guideline, and 13 primary practice described by extreme programming. 5 values of extreme programming are communication, simplicity, feedback, courage, and respect. 14 principles as additional guidelines are humanity, economics, mutual benefit, self-similarity, improvement, diversity, reflection, flow, opportunity, redundancy, failure, quality, baby steps, and accepted responsibility. And 13 primary practices are sit together, whole team, informative workspace, energized work, pair programming, stories, weekly cycle, quarterly cycle, slack, 10 minutes build, continuous integration, test first programming, and incremental design. With this, the lecture ends. In this lecture, we will cover Scrum. First, we will cover what is Scrum. Then we will cover Scrum instruments and Scrum practices. And at the end, we will cover three roles defined in Scrum. Let's first see what is Scrum. Scrum is an agile management framework, and the framework looks like this, where framework is made up of instruments and practices, and three roles are defined in it. Instruments of agile are sprint, product increment, product backlog, and sprint backlog. Scrum practices are definition of done, time boxing, and transparency. The three defined roles are Scrum Master Product Owner and Development Team. Now we will cover each of these in detail. Let's see first instruments of Agile. First is Sprint. Scrum divides a project into iterations, called sprints, of fixed length, usually two to four weeks. Next is Product Increment. Each sprint results in a potentially releasable or shippable product called an increment. Third instrument is product backlog. The product owner manages a prioritized list of planned product items called 
the product backlog. The items are called user stories. The product backlog evolves from sprint to sprint, called backlog refinement. The last instrument is sprint backlog. At the start of each sprint, the scrum team selects a set of highest priority items, called the sprint backlog from the product backlog. Since the scrum team, not the product owner, selects the items to be realized within the sprint, the selection is referred to as being on the pull principle rather than the push principle. Now let's see the workflow to understand how these instruments work in real time. First, the product owner selects the requirement which needs to be implemented. Then, the team selects the requirement from the product backlog, which they will implement in the current sprint and this is called iteration backlog or sprint backlog. The cycle in which the sprint backlog is implemented is called sprint. Similar to this, the next sprint is selected and the process continues until all the requirement in product backlog are implemented and it is referred as product increment. Now let's move on to the Scrum practices. These are the three Scrum practices. Definition of done, time boxing, and transparency. Where definition of done is used to make sure that there is a potentially releasable product at each sprint's end. The Scrum team discusses and defines appropriate criteria for sprint completion. The discussion deepens the team's understanding of the backlog items and the product requirements. Next is time boxing. Let's understand this. Only those tasks, requirements, or features that the team expects to finish within the sprint are part of the sprint backlog. If the development team cannot finish a task within a sprint, the associated product features are removed from the sprint and the task is moved back into the product backlog. Time boxing applies not only to tasks, but in other situations, for example, enforcing meeting start and end times. For example, the retrospective would be a three-hour time boxed meeting for a project using one-month sprints. The last one is transparency. The development team reports and updates sprint status on a daily basis at a meeting called the Daily Scrum. This makes the content and progress of the current sprint, including test results, visible to the team, management, and all interested parties. For example, the development team can show sprint status on a whiteboard. Now let's see the workflow to understand how these practices work in real work environment. We will use the same picture for explanation, and in my last explanation we saw how to create a sprint. Now the scrum practices are used in each sprint. First is definition of done. During the starting of the sprint we have some goal to achieve. For example, our goal is to complete four user stories. Then completing four user story is the definition of a done. And once the four user stories are done, we can say that the current sprint is completed. Now we have defined the timing for each user stories, which is referred as time box. This is to make sure work is completed on time. Complete process shall be done in a transparent environment, and to do that, we have daily meeting to know how is doing what and what is the status of each task. This is all about Scrum practice. Now, let's see roles defined in Scrum. These are the three roles. Scrum Master, Product Owner, and Development Team. Where Scrum Master is, the Scrum Master ensures that Scrum practices and rules are implemented and followed and resolves any violations, resource issues, or other impediments that could prevent the team from following the practices and rules. This person is not the team lead, but a coach. Next is Product Owner. The Product Owner represents the customer and generates, maintains, and prioritizes the product backlog. This person is not the team lead, but represents the business point of view and makes all business-related decisions. And last role is development team. 
the development team develop and test the product. Before we end this lecture, let's have a look into a few more important points. The team in Scrum is self-organized. There is no team lead, so the team makes the decisions. The team is also cross-functional. Scrum does not dictate specific software development techniques. In addition, Scrum does not provide guidance on how testing has to be done in a Scrum project. With this, we end the lecture here. Hello and welcome to the ISTQB Foundation Level Training and Certification Program. Single solution for your preparation. This accredited course is going to teach you each and everything you need to know to become a successful ISTQB Certified Professional. While other courses only cover the theoretical concepts, our course not only covers these theoretical concepts, but also covers real-time examples. In addition, we make sure you remember the topics by providing revisions, quizzes, and different exercises. The highlight of this course is that it contains topic-wise explanation, topic-wise quizzes, chapter-wise quizzes, 11 question papers from 2017 to 2020, two practice sets to practice before you attend the exam. In total, you will get more than 1,500 questions, which is enough to clear the real ISTQB exam. Our courses are not developed by just one person, but a special team of highly qualified professionals and experienced educators who are working in the leading industries. This includes subject matter experts to help you with technical topics, trained voiceover artists to make sure you get a great audio learning experience, and experienced graphic designer to enhance the visualization. We have a wide experience in teaching online and we have more than 30 popular courses listed in online platform for different certifications. It is our genuine pleasure to use all our experience and expertise to train you and help you obtain an official ISTQB certification. As of now, we are teaching in 143 countries with more than 1 lakh students and still growing. Now it's your turn to join our growing family and become part of it. In return, you will get advice from industry experts who will help you throughout the course. Join ISTQB Foundation Level Training by enrolling now and become part of us. There is no need to worry. This course is backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee. You got nothing to lose. Let's get you ISTQB certified. In this lecture, we will cover Kanban, which is the third management approach of Agile projects. So, what is Kanban? A Kanban is a management approach that is sometimes used in Agile projects. The general objective is to visualize and optimize the flow of work within a value-added chain. Let's see Kanban instruments. Kanban utilizes three instruments. Kanban board, work in progress limits, and lead time. What is a Kanban board? The value chain to be managed is visualized by a Kanban board. This is how a Kanban board looks like, where you have complete details like what are the backlogs, tasks which are in progress, tasks which are under review, tasks which are tested, and status of tasks which are completed and it also provides the status of blocked tasks. So just by seeing the Kanban board, one can get the complete picture of the current sprint. Next instrument is work in progress limits. In Kanban, the amount of parallel active tasks is strictly limited. This is controlled by the maximum number of tickets allowed for a station and or globally for the board. Whenever a station has free capacity, the worker pulls a ticket from the predecessor station. Ideally, the team should work on very few tasks at any one time as their focus would be too spread out, and the tasks would probably not be finished as quickly as if they only concentrate on, let's say, two at a time. The last instrument is lead time. Kanban is used to optimize the continuous flow of tasks by minimizing the average lead time for the complete value stream. These were the three instruments of Kanban.
Along with instruments, Kanban has some features similar to Scrum, like transparency. In both frameworks, visualizing the active tasks, for example on a public whiteboard, provides transparency of content and progress of tasks. Tasks not yet scheduled are waiting in a backlog and moved onto the Kanban board as soon as there is a new space, production capacity, available. Product Interment Iterations or sprints are optional in Kanban. The Kanban process allows releasing its deliverables item by item, rather than as part of a release. Timeboxing as a synchronizing mechanism, therefore, is optional, unlike in Scrum, which synchronizes all tasks within a sprint. Let's summarize the points. A Kanban is a management approach that is sometimes used in agile projects. Kanban utilizes three instruments. Kanban board, work in progress limits, lead time. Kanban features some similarities to Scrum, like transparency and releasing item by item. In this lecture, we will cover collaborative user story creation. The learning objective is to write testable user stories in collaboration with developers and business representatives. This is marked as K3. Let's see what are problems of poor specification. Poor specifications are often a major reason for project failure. Specification problems can result from the user's lack of insight into their true needs, absence of a global vision for the system, redundant or contradictory features, other miscommunications. In agile development, user stories are written to capture requirements from the perspectives of developers, testers, and business representatives. This point is very important, so please do remember it. Here, we will see how acquiring a shared vision of a feature happens in sequential development and in agile development. In sequential development, this shared vision of a feature is accomplished through formal reviews after requirements are written. In agile development, this shared vision is accomplished through frequent informal reviews while the requirements are being written. One point which is very important for the user story is that the user stories must address both functional and non-functional characteristics, and each user story must have an acceptance criterion. Each story includes acceptance criteria for these characteristics. These criteria should be defined in collaboration between business representatives, developers, and testers. They provide developers and testers with an extended vision of the feature that business representatives will validate. An agile team considers a task finished when a set of acceptance criteria have been satisfied. And during user story creation or brainstorming, tester can provide unique perspective. Typically, the tester's unique perspective will improve the user story by identifying missing details or non-functional requirements. A tester can contribute by asking business representatives open-minded questions about the user story, proposing ways to test the user story, and confirming the acceptance criteria. Collaborative user story creation uses different techniques like brainstorming and mind mapping. For this, the tester can use INVEST technique, and INVEST stands for Independent, Negotiable, Valuable, Estimable, Small, Testable, where independent means that the user's story should be self-contained in a way that there is no inherent dependency on another user's story. Negotiable means that the user story can be changed and rewritten before they become part of the iteration, so teams should be ready for it. Next is valuable, which means a user story must deliver value to the end user. Next is estimable, 
you must always be able to estimate the size of a user story. Next is small. User stories should not be so big as to become impossible to plan or task or prioritize with a certain level of certainty. Last one is testable. The user story or its related description must provide the necessary information to make test development possible. Now let's see the last topic of this lecture. 3C concept. According to the 3C concept, a user story is a conjunction of three elements, card, conversation, and confirmation. The card is the physical media describing a user story. It identifies the requirement, its criticality, expected development, and test duration, and the acceptance criteria for that story. The description has to be accurate as it will be used in the product backlog. Next is conversation. The conversation explains how the software will be used. The conversation can be documented or verbal. Testers having a different point of view than developers and business representatives bring valuable input to the exchange of thoughts, opinions, and experiences. Conversation begins during the release planning phase and continues when the story is scheduled. The last element is confirmation. The acceptance criteria discussed in the conversation are used to confirm that the story is done. These acceptance criteria may span multiple user stories. Both positive and negative tests should be used to cover the criteria. During confirmation, various participants play the role of a tester. These can include developers as well as specialists focused on performance, security, interoperability, and other quality characteristics. To confirm a story as done, the defined acceptance criteria should be tested and shown to be satisfied. Now let's summarize the points. First, we covered the problems of the poor specification, the user's lack of insight into their true needs, absence of a global vision for the system, redundant of contradictory features, and other miscommunications. Then we covered different points to be covered in acceptance criteria. After that, we saw how tester can provide their unique perspective while creating a user story. Next, we saw invest technique, which stands for independent, negotiable, valuable, estimable, small, testable. At the end, we covered 3C concept where 3C means card, conversation, and confirmation. In this lecture, we will cover retrospectives. The learning objective here is to understand how retrospectives can be used as a mechanism for process improvement in Agile projects. This is marked as K2. The retrospective meeting is an end of iteration meeting. That means once the iteration is completed, the team conducts this meeting. In agile development, a retrospective is a meeting held at the end of each iteration. Now the next question is, why is this meeting conducted? It is conducted to discuss what was successful, what could be improved, and how to incorporate the improvements and retain the successes in future iterations. Like this, you can ask many questions and try to find out answers for it in the meeting. Remember this point. A retrospective is a meeting held at the end of each iteration. Now let's move to the next point. During the meeting, we can discuss a topic such as the process, people, organizations, relationships, and tools. Process-related points could be, is the process simple and practical? Can we further optimize the process? Is the implemented process effective? Next is people. Here we can discuss, is the effort allocated for the development sufficient to complete the task? 
Is anyone facing any technical challenge? The next point is organizations. Here, we can ask if the team member is getting sufficient support from the organization and management to complete their task. The next point is relationships. Here, we can ask open questions if people have a good relationship with each other or how we can improve it. The last point is tools. Here, we can discuss the tool used during the iteration. We can ask questions like, is the tool effective? And what are the tasks we can automate further? Also, to work effectively and to reduce the effort, do we need to purchase a new tool? These were the five topics that we could discuss. Process, people, organizations, relationships, and tools. Now let's see a very important point. Retrospective meetings are helpful for continual improvement of development and testing. If they are conducted regularly or appropriate follow-up activities occur. Now let's see an example of a few points we shall discuss in improvement decisions. In the retrospective meeting, we can discuss test-related improvement. For example, we can focus on test effectiveness, test productivity, test case quality, and team satisfaction. We can also discuss on testability, testability of the applications, user stories, features, or system interfaces, the next point is related to root cause analysis. Root cause analysis of defects can drive testing and development improvements. The last point is related to improvements. In general, teams should implement only a few improvements per iteration. This allows for continuous improvement at a sustained pace. This point is important. We should not try to change everything in the team to implement improvements that will create more damage than improvement. Improvements should be done slowly at a sustained pace. These were the four points that we can discuss. Test-related improvements, testability-related points, root cause analysis, and other improvements. Now let's see the timing and organization of the retrospectives meeting. The timing and organization of the retrospectives depend on the particular Agile method followed. Usually done at the end of the iteration, business representatives and the team attend each retrospective as participants while the facilitator organizes and runs the meeting. In some cases, the teams may invite other participants to the meeting. Retrospectives must occur within a professional environment characterized by mutual trust. What you need to remember is, retrospectives meeting usually done at the end of the iteration. Now let's see what is the tester's role in retrospectives. Testers should play an important role in retrospectives. Testers are part of the team and bring their unique perspective. Testing occurs in each sprint and vitally contributes to success. All team members, testers, and non-testers can provide inputs on both testing and non-testing activities. Now let's summarize the important points. First, we discussed the retrospective meeting is an end of iteration meeting. Then, we covered during the meeting, we can discuss a topic such as the process, people, organizations, relationships, and tools. And retrospective meetings are helpful for continual improvement of development and testing if they are conducted regularly or appropriate follow-up activities occur. Then we saw the four points which we can discuss during retrospective meetings. Test-related improvements, testability-related points, root cause analysis, and other improvements. And in the end, we covered the tester's role in retrospectives. 
With this, the lecture ends. In this lecture, we will cover a very important concept, continuous integration. Let's first see what is the aim of continuous integration. Continuous integration aims to provide reliable, working, integrated software at the end of each sprint. Let's understand this point. During the sprint, we perform many activities. For example, all the developers implement code and then test the implemented code. To make sure everything is working at the end of the sprint, we go for continuous integration. Remember this. Continuous integration aims to provide reliable, working, integrated software at the end of each sprint. Now let's understand the concept and need for continuous integration. Suppose there are three developers, developer 1, developer 2, and developer 3, who are implementing the code. Once they complete the implementation, they store it in the repository. Usually. At the end of the day, everyone puts their code in the repository. Since three different developers are implementing the code, once their work is done, we have to integrate their code, so make a single working software. That means all the newly implemented code are integrated into the main software daily. Now the question is, why do we need to do that? We need to integrate the software continuously so that the next day the developers get the working software, and on top of that, they will develop the new feature. Continuous integration process ensures that they will get working software every day. Now suppose after integrating the code received from developer 2, the build failed. In such a case, the developer 2 will be informed and his code will not be accepted for integration until the fix is available. That is why we say continuous integration ensures that the working software is available and issue in the code is found early. The next day, all the developers will take the code from the repository and continue their work and this process continues until the end of the sprint. This is how continuous integration process works and it is one of the important aspects of an Agile project. In this lecture, we will cover continuous integration. Here, the learning objective is to understand the use and purpose of continuous integration. This is marked as K2. Now let's see the activities of continuous integration. These are the six activities of continuous integration. Static code analysis. Compile. Unit test. Deploy, Integration Test, and Report. Where we perform static code analysis on the developed code, and once testing is done, we provide the report. Then, we compile and link the code and generate the executable files. Once the code is completed, we perform unit testing on it and report the test result. And once unit testing is done, we move to the deployment phase, where we install the build into the test environment. Build is nothing but compiled code. Once the deployment is done, we can perform integration testing on it and generate the report. At the end, we are posting the status of all the activities to a publicly visible location or email status to the team. Now, 
This picture shows the complete workflow of a continuous integration process. Once the source code is developed and available, we do version controlling of it. That means we provide a unique ID to it so that it is easily identifiable. Then we start the build process where we complete the compiling and linking process and executable files are generated. Then we perform the static code analysis on it. And once that is done, we perform unit testing on the code by running automated test scripts. After that, we analyze the generated report to see code coverage. Once all the things are fine, we store the result and it's called artifacts. Once the unit testing is done, we move to the functional testing of the code. For that first, we have to set up the test environment by changing it to test new features. Once the test environment is ready, we can run functional testing automated scripts. Then we can publish the over result or email to the development team. This process continues until all the features are implemented. That is why it is called a continuous integration process. But you just have to remember that continuous integration has six activities. Static code analysis, compile, unit test, deploy, integration test, and report. One of the important aspects of continuous integration is that we have to regularly run automated tests. An automated build and test process takes place on a daily basis and detects integration errors early and quickly. Continuous integration allows agile testers to run automated tests regularly, in some cases as part of the continuous integration process itself, and send quick feedback to the team on the quality of the code. These test results are visible to all team members, especially when automated reports are integrated into the process. Another of the important aspects of continuous integration is regression testing. Automated regression testing can be continuous throughout the iteration. Good automated regression tests cover as much functionality as possible including user stories delivered in the previous iterations. Good coverage in the automated regression tests helps support building and testing large integrated systems. When the regression testing is automated, the agile testers are freed to concentrate their manual testing on new features, implemented changes, and confirmation testing of defect fixes. Continuous integration also helps in continuous quality control. Let's see how. In addition to automated tests, organizations use continuous integration, typically use build tools to implement continuous quality control. In addition to running unit and integration tests, such tools can run additional static and dynamic tests, measure and profile performance, extract and format documentation from the source code and facilitate manual quality assurance processes. This continuous application of quality control aims to improve the quality of the product as well as reduce the time taken to deliver it by replacing the traditional practice of applying quality control after completing all development. And in most of the organizations, build tools are linked to automatic deployment tools. Let's see why. Build tools can be linked to automatic deployment tools, which can fetch the appropriate build from the continuous integration or build server and deploy it into one or more development, test, staging, or even production environments. This reduces the errors and delays associated with relying on specialized staff or programmers to install releases in these environments. Continuous integration requires the use of tools, including tools for testing, tools for automating the build process, and tools for version control. In this lecture, we covered six activities of continuous integration, static code analysis, compile, unit test, deploy, integration test, and report. 
Then we saw two aspects of continuous integration, regularly run automated tests and regression testing. Then we saw how continuous integration helps in continuous quality control. In the next lecture, we will cover the benefit and risk of continuous integration. In this lecture, we will cover benefits and risks of continuous integration. The benefits are self-explanatory, so I will just go through it. Continuous integration can provide the following benefits. Allows earlier detection and easier root cause analysis of integration problems and conflicting changes. Gives the development team regular feedback on whether the code is working. Keeps the version of the software being tested within a day of the version being developed. Reduces regression risk associated with developer code refactoring due to rapid retesting of the code base after each small set of changes. Provides confidence that each day's development work is based on a solid foundation. Makes progress toward the completion of the product increment visible, encouraging developers and testers. Eliminates the schedule risks associated with Big Bang integration. Provides constant availability of executable software throughout the sprint for testing, demonstration, or education purposes. Reduces repetitive manual testing activities. Provides quick feedback on decisions made to improve quality and tests. Now let's see risks and challenges of continuous integration. However, Continuous integration is not without its risks and challenges. Continuous integration tools have to be introduced and maintained. The continuous integration process must be defined and established. Test automation requires additional resources and can be complex to establish. Thorough test coverage is essential to achieve automated testing advantages. Teams sometimes over-rely on unit tests and perform too little system and acceptance testing. With this, the continuous integration topic ends. In this lecture, we will cover release and iteration planning. Here, the learning objective is to know the differences between iteration and release planning and how a tester adds value in each of these activities. This is marked as K1. Let's first recall the test planning we covered in the foundation level syllabus. Test planning involves activities that define the objectives of testing. So, test planning is the stage where we decide what we need to test and what we want to achieve from it. It also includes an approach for meeting test objectives within constraints imposed by the context. We know that testing is context dependent. Based on what we test, we decide in the test planning stage which approach we will use. And the last point is test plans may be revisited based on feedback from monitoring and control activities. These are the three main points of test planning. Defining test objective, defining test approach, updating plan base on feedback. This is what we covered in foundation level syllabus. But in agile development, it is a bit different. We do two kinds of planning for the agile life cycle. Release planning, and iteration planning. Before we go further, what you need to keep in mind is that release planning is higher level planning done for the next few months. Whereas to finish one release planning, we may need two of three iteration plans. In this lecture, we will cover release planning. Let's first see what is release planning. Release planning looks ahead to the release of a product often a few months ahead of the start of the project. Let's understand this. Suppose you are making a plan in the month of July to release the product in October. That means you are planning for the next three months. This is the first point. The second point is, 
Release planning defines and redefines the product backlog and may involve refining larger user stories into a collection of smaller stories. Now let's understand this point. During release planning, we have to define the product backlog. To define the product backlog, we have to analyze the user stories. And if we see that the user story can be divided further, then we have to do that. By doing this, we are dividing the larger user stories to smaller user stories so that we can plan them easily. Remember this point. The project backlog is defined during release planning. The third point is release planning provides the basis for a test approach and test plan spanning all iterations. Let's understand this point. In release planning, we decide how many iterations we need for implementing the release planning. Suppose we decide to execute five iterations for the next three months to implement this release planning. With all the three points which we explained here, we can clearly say that release planning is high level planning. Remember these four points. Release planning looks ahead to the release of a product, often a few months ahead of a start of a project. Release planning defines and redefines the product backlog and may involve refining larger user stories into a collection of smaller stories. Release planning provides the basis for a test approach and test plan spanning all iterations. And release planning is high level planning. Now we will see who establishes and prioritizes the user stories for the release. In release planning, business representatives establish and prioritize the user stories for the release in collaboration with the team. This point is very important. Business representatives establish and prioritize the user stories for the release in collaboration with the team. And based on the user stories prepared by business representatives, Project and quality risks are identified and high-level effort estimation is performed. Now let's see what the testers activity in release planning. Testers are involved in release planning and especially add value in the following activities. Defining testable user stories, including acceptance criteria. Participating in project and quality risk analysis. Estimating testing effort associated with the user stories. Defining the necessary test levels. Planning the testing for the release. Here we can see testers also make high level planning. In the next lecture, we will cover iteration planning where we will see the detailed planning made by testers. Let's summarize the points we covered in this lecture. For agile life cycles, two kinds of planning occur. Release planning, iteration planning, where release planning looks ahead to the release of a product, often a few months ahead of the start of a project. And iteration planning is done for a short period. Then we saw business representatives in collaboration with team establish and prioritize the user stories for the release and based on that project and quality risks are identified and high level effort estimation is performed at the end we covered testers contributions in release planning in this lecture we will cover iteration planning what is iteration planning? After release planning is done, iteration planning for the first iteration starts. Iteration planning looks ahead to the end of a single iteration and is concerned with the iteration backlog. In simple terms, here we make planning for short duration compared to release planning. Now let's see team activities in iteration planning. In iteration planning, the team selects user stories from the prioritized release backlog. As we know, during release planning, user stories are assigned to each iteration. And during iteration planning, we need to prioritize the user story for the upcoming iteration. 
The second point is the team elaborates the user stories. Once the user stories are prioritized, the team go through each user story and try to elaborate it for more clarity. The third point is team performs a risk analysis for the user stories. And the last point is team estimates the work needed for each user story. That means effort for the user stories are calculated during iteration planning. These are the tasks team do during iteration planning. Selects user stories from the prioritized release backlog. Elaborates the user stories. Performs a risk analysis for the user stories. Estimates the work needed for each user story. Now let's go through some important points. If a user story is too vague and attempts to clarify it have failed, the team can refuse to accept it and use the next user story based on priority. The business representatives must answer the team's questions about each story so the team can understand what they should implement and how to test each story. So these are the activities done by team in iteration planning. Now we are going to cover an important concept, velocity. At the end of each iteration, the team adds up effort estimates associated with user stories that were completed during that iteration. This is called velocity. Once the velocity is known, the team can compute or revise an estimate of how long the project will take to complete, based on the estimates associated with remaining user stories Assuming that velocity over the remaining iterations will remain approximately the same. The number of stories selected is based on established team velocity and the estimated size of the selected user stories. After the contents of the iteration are finalized, the user stories are broken into tasks, which will be carried out by the appropriate team members. So this is how user story is selected based on team velocity and tasks are assigned to the team member. Now we will see what is tester's activity in iteration planning. Since these points are simple, I will just go through it. Testers are involved in iteration planning and especially add value in the following activities. Participating in the detailed risk analysis of user stories. Determining the testability of the user stories. Creating acceptance tests for the user stories. Breaking down user stories into tasks, particularly testing tasks. Estimating testing effort for all testing tasks. Identifying functional and non-functional aspects of the system to be tested. Supporting and participating in test automation at multiple levels of testing. Now from the exam point of view, you need to know what are the testers' tasks in release planning and what are the testers' tasks in iteration planning. In the upcoming video, we will provide an exercise so that you can practice it. In this lecture, we will continue with Release Plan and Iteration Plan. Here we will talk about the changes in Release Plan. As we already learned in Foundation Level Syllabus, Release Plans may change as the project proceeds based on feedback from the field. Same is applicable to Agile Planning. The factors that influences planning in Agile Project could be internal or external. Internal factors include delivery capabilities, velocity, technical issues, and external factors include the discovery of new markets and opportunities, new competitors, and business threats. In addition to these factors, iteration plans may change during an iteration. For example, a particular user story that was considered relatively simple during estimation might prove more complex than expected. Then, based on the current analysis, it will be replanned. Now let's see some of the impact of change in planning. These changes can be challenging for testers. 
Testers must understand the big picture of the release for test planning purposes, and they must have an adequate test basis and test oracle in each iteration for test development purposes as discussed in the foundation level. The required information must be available to the tester early, and yet change must be embraced according to Agile principles. This dilemma requires careful decisions about test strategies and test documentation. At the end, we need to know test-related issues within planning. Release and iteration planning should address test planning as well as planning for development activities. Particular test-related issues to address include the scope of testing, the extent of testing for those areas in scope, the test goals, and the reasons for these decisions the team members who will carry out the test activities, the test environment and test data needed, when they are needed, and whether any additions or changes to the test environment and data will occur prior to or during the project, the timing, sequencing, dependencies, and prerequisites for the run regression tests, which features depend on other features or test data, including how the test activities relate to and depend on development activities, the project and quality risks to be addressed. In addition, the larger team estimation effort should include consideration of the time and effort needed to complete the required testing activities. In this lecture, we will cover all the keywords which is applicable to Chapter 1. First keyword is Agile Manifesto, a statement on the values that underpin Agile software development. The values are individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan. Agile software development is a group of software development methodologies based on iterative incremental development, where requirements and solutions evolve through collaboration between self-organizing cross-functional teams. Incremental Development Model A development life cycle where a project is broken into a series of increments, each of which delivers a portion of the functionality in the overall project requirements. The requirements are prioritized and delivered in priority order in the appropriate increment. In some, not all, versions of this lifecycle model, each sub-project follows a mini-V model with its own designs, coding, and testing phases. Iterative Development Model It is a development lifecycle where a project is broken into a usually large number of iterations. An iteration is a complete development loop resulting in a release, internal or external, of an executable product, a subset of the final product under development, which grows from iteration to iteration to become the final product. Software lifecycle is the period of time that begins when a software product is conceived and ends when the software is no longer available for use. The software life cycle typically includes a concept phase, requirements phase, design phase, implementation phase, test phase, installation and checkout phase, operation and maintenance phase, and sometimes retirement phase. Note that these phases may overlap or be performed iteratively. Test automation is a use of software to perform or support test activities, for example, test management, test design, test execution, and results checking. Test bases is all documents from which the requirements of a component or system can be inferred. The documentation on which the test cases are based. If a document can be amended only by way of formal amendment procedure, then the test basis is called a frozen test basis. Test-driven development is the way of developing software where the test cases are developed and often automated before the software is developed to run those test cases. The last one, Test Oracle, 
is a source to determine expected results to compare with the actual results of the software under test. An oracle may be the existing system for a benchmark, other software, a user manual, or an individual's specialized knowledge, but should not be the code. With this, all the keywords are covered. Hello and welcome to the ISTQB Foundation Level Training and Certification Program. Single solution for your preparation. This accredited course is going to teach you each and everything you need to know to become a successful ISTQB certified professional. While other courses only cover the theoretical concepts, our course not only covers these theoretical concepts, but also covers real-time examples. In addition, we make sure you remember the topics by providing revisions, quizzes, and different exercises. The highlight of this course is that it contains topic-wise explanation, topic-wise quizzes, chapter-wise quizzes, 11 question papers from 2017 to 2020, two practice sets to practice before you attend the exam. In total, you will get more than 1,500 questions, which is enough to clear the real ISTQB exam. Our courses are not developed by just one person, but a special team of highly qualified professionals and experienced educators who are working in the leading industries. This includes subject matter experts to help you with technical topics, trained voiceover artists to make sure you get a great audio learning experience, and experienced graphic designer to enhance the visualization. We have a wide experience in teaching online and we have more than 30 popular courses listed in online platform for different certifications. It is our genuine pleasure to use all our experience and expertise to train you and help you obtain an official ISTQB certification. As of now, we are teaching in 143 countries with more than 1 lakh students and still growing. Now it's your turn to join our growing family and become part of it. In return, you will get advice from industry experts who will help you throughout the course. Join ISTQB Foundation Level Training by enrolling now and become part of us. There is no need to worry. This course is backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee. You got nothing to lose. Let's get you ISTQB certified.